I thought this next one was pretty basic rookie of the year. Yeah. I mean, top two. we were talking mm-hmm. about it before. I, I kind of think like you can make arguments for any of the top four really um, where I have Chris Duarte and Josh Giddy as like the true honorable mentions. And then Franz Wagner as my top honorable mention. But if you want to make a case for him actually winning this award, because he's been arguably the most productive rookie playing big minutes he's looked the part of just an actual offensive contributor who is not taking away from what his team is trying to do then then be my guest if you want to argue for Jalen Green who has probably shown the most advanced shot making shot generating skills of any member of this rookie class I I have him at number three just because I think the opportunity that he's received for a really bad Houston team is significant and isn't something that's afforded to every rookie, namely the two that I have above him because they're playing for better, more competitive teams that aren't just willing to let their first year players go out and truly learn on the job to the same extent the Rockets are affording green. Um, I still think he's a reasonable pick though, just because of the skill that he's displayed to this point. So for me, it came down to Scotty Barnes versus Evan Mobley. And I did end up going with Scotty Barnes just because of the two way presence that he's shown for a highly competitive Toronto Raptors team. He's been far more advanced than expected on the offensive end, just making good reads already hitting catch and shoot jumpers. If the closeout comes too quickly, he can put the ball on the floor. He can reasonably find an open shooter um, as that defense then scrambles. His defense has been highly impactful in a number of different situations. So I think I'm still viewing Evan Mobley, who we talked about extensively on a previous episode. I'm still viewing Mobley as the highest ceiling prospect from this bunch, but I do think he struggled a little bit more to find his shot. The flashes have been there. They just haven't come with the same degree of consistency that Barnes has shown. And while he's been incredibly impactful on defense as well, and it's manifesting itself as that positionless ability where we realistically think that he can guard positions one through five. Again, it's been accompanied by more warts. Granted, Barnes probably has a better defensive system to fall back upon. He's playing alongside a number of other, like all defensive candidates who make his life a little bit easier. But I think we've seen more upside with Mobley, but also a little bit more of those first year struggles those barriers that have to be overcome than Barnes who has been just a little bit more consistent. It's neck and neck for me, but I do ultimately have Barnes at one Mobley at two and green at three. So that I sends Mo- the rambling there. Cause I'm just still trying to process this one. I have Mobley at one and Barnes at two. And the separation came for me. I feel like Barnes has like a more see Occam's missed time and he's returning as we record this, but I, Barnes has like a better ecosystem around him where Mobley has yeah. had to defend on the perimeter so much as a big and the fact that he's still been so impactful on the defensive end and is so important to what they're doing and to propping up lineups that have both Allen and, and Lowry market in, in them. I weight that a little heavier right now. I do think that Barnes has the ability just to he's look feel has become this buzzword, this cliche. He has it. Like when you're just before he even has the ball, sometimes it feels like he's throwing passes before he has the ball because he's just so aware I think he's been uh, just better when you put the ball in his hands as when to navigate traffic. He's shooting fairly well from mid range, though some of them have come on like these weird catch and shoot mid range jumpers. And I don't know whether to like dock him for that or not. He, by the end of the season, it would not surprise me if he's number one. They're neck and neck for me. I just view the context of Evan Mobley's role as a lot harder. And the fact that he's been this good playing out of his, that's not, it seems like he's comfortable defending the way that he is where he's contesting a, a ton of jumpers. And I know, by the way, I know people cited that stat. It's like, oh, look at all these shots that he's contesting. That's like volume doesn't imply effectiveness. And I think Mobley's been good, but like that's not, you know, I guess it kind of supports like the case or whatever, but I was just, I thought it was interesting that it was being used as just this tell-all for his defense when really it's just look at the breadth, the scope of assignments that he has covered. And he is so mission critical to them if they want to continue playing with Allen, with Larry Marketing, to even like some of their guard combinations that we've seen this year. And he's important to just like what they want to do in the half court offensively, because he does have um, great vision and, and floor awareness himself. 
neck and neck though. If you're Barnes is numbers, like the raw numbers too. And you're just looking like, I didn't even realize. I feel like every time I look at his numbers, it's like, oh, he's averaging over 17 points per game. That looks like a typo. Like that doesn't look like a thing. And at number three, I went with Chris Duarte. This was tough. It was between him and Franz Wagner for me. Wagner's been so good shooting so well from three. He moves well without the ball. He's, you know, he can get dudes like off of his shoulder, finishes really well with his right hand, probably needs to get more comfortable doing his left, but he's comfortable dribbling with more comfortable than I thought coming in dribbling with his left. It's just that the, the context, the, the word that we keep championing here of Duarte's role, where it was like, you had to put him on ball a ton. He's hit some really tough buzzer beaters. And yes, it was out of necessity a lot in part because, you know, Malcolm Brogdon missed some time. Karis LeVert only just returned a few games ago. He's shooting 39% on off the dribble threes as a rookie. I know he's the oldest rookie, but I have to, his role seems, his usage, offensive usage seems more difficult to me, as do a lot of the defensive assignments that he was being put on earlier in the year, like going up against the Heat and finding himself on Jimmy Butler. That being said, I have been impressed with Wagner not being like a total, I didn't think he could defend the three. And I still don't think like, yeah, we need to throw him on like Jimmy Butler. Like that's not what you need him to do. But he's just been, when you're playing in a front court that has Mo Bamba, Wendell Carter Jr. And like having them go after wings is not an option uh, full time. He's been better than I've expected. So sort of neck and neck there. But I do think like how much the ball has been in Duarte's hands and what he's had to do on offense for Indy, especially again, prior to the past two or three games, whatever it is, that, that sways it in his favor to me. The fact that you can say he's had multiple tough buzzer beaters 10 games into a rookie season is just objectively ridiculous. It's, know, just, it's, it's already become it a thing it's at like, the end of quarters. Yeah, it's end of quarters, shot clock stuff. Like he has not been hitting game right. winners left and right. Just wanted to right. make that clear. I think the other thing in the Barnes Mobley discussion for me is that Barnes is doing this for an objectively better team. So that's a that's a good on, point. On one hand, it does make it easier for him to fill the gaps in a way that Mobley doesn't have the luxury of doing because as you said, he is being tasked with guarding more perimeter players than you would want from a first year big. But on, on the other hand, like Barnes is contributing on a much better team. And like I, I know the, the easy counter argument here is they're both six and four. But like I'm going to use basketball references, simple rating system here, which looks at point differential and strength of schedule. And the Raptors are at 5.6. The Cavaliers are at minus 0.51 at the time we're recording this because the Cavs do, despite their six and four record, have a negative net rating. They have been outscored on the season and they've played uh, an easier than average schedule, whereas the Raptors have obliterated some opponents enough to have a distinctly positive net rating while playing one of the 10 most ske- most difficult schedules to this point. So just doing similar things to me on vastly different quality teams that matters when we're splitting hairs. I think, I think that's an absolutely great point. 